we are excited to uh, welcome today Mary Jane. So I want to take you back to this moment when I was in college. I was 20 years old, and I was sitting in a um, in a in a classroom with a professor in my New England school, and. Um, my professor, I'll just tell you, he was kind of a legend in the school. He'd written 37 books, and he had his own experience with trauma. He had a pronounced stutter. So um, when he gave me this feedback, you can imagine that it was pretty drawn out when he, shared, when, he, when he spoke to me. So I was in his writing class, and he pulled up my essay, and in front of the class, he said, Mary Jane, you cannot write. I teach Olympic swimmers how to swim better. I don't teach beginners how to do the doggy paddle. And I was humiliated in front of this group of people, but what he didn't know was that at that time, I was suffering with a chronic mental illness, which was a dissociative disorder where I couldn't feel anything on my skin. So I couldn't, I, I had no, it was a dissociative disorder called DPDR. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I couldn't feel anything. So if you went to touch me, I couldn't feel touch on my skin. It was, it was a really odd experience. Um, and I'll give you some descriptors because it's hard to understand if you haven't experienced it. Um, but I, when I would, I was basically here outside of my body and my body would move and I would have to like think to squeeze the muscles in my neck in order to speak. And when I would read, I would see myself seeing the page, right? Um, when I would hear, I would hear myself hearing um, words so, or, or hearing sound double. So every time I would like engage in a learning process, reading, listening to music, trying to play the piano, it would remind me about how severe my trauma was. So it was unbelievably difficult to be in school. And looking back at this time, I think it's pretty amazing that I was able to graduate from college. And you know, now in my life, I work with lots of people who share stories with me. And I'm like, how did you get through those times in your life? Um, but I'll just kind of quickly give you the overview that when I moved back to New Orleans in 2007, um, I took the only jobs that I could manage, which were working at coffee shops, working at bakeries, repetitive jobs. Um, because essentially, I had two jobs. I had the job of making money, which at that time, my overhead was probably $1,300 a month, um, which gave me extra cash to kind of like be in the world. Um, but I had a second job too, which was when I, so I would wake up at four in the morning and I, I lived in the uptown area and I would bicycle at like 4.30 to the, the Starbucks downtown. And um, then we would, I would work the shift and I would get off at 11.30 and I would go to my second job, which was essentially a full time process of trying to heal from this dissociative di disorder that I couldn't get support on. Like there was not a lot of tools to talk, uh, to, to help me move through this form of PTSD at the time. So um, I tried so many methods and um, you know, it, it seemed like even though I was trying so many things, it felt like nothing worked. It felt like there wasn't a light at the end of the tunnel. And because of the nature of trauma, um, you lose the evaluative lens to track pro progress. So um, I couldn't tell what was working. I couldn't tell if I was experiencing any growth, but I was doggedly persistent about kind of creating this solution for myself. And on May 31st, 2010, after 10 years of this experience, in a moment while working at Starbucks, I healed. I was suddenly back in my body and it happened in a moment as quickly as I disappeared from my body when I was 17. So in that moment, I could suddenly feel my skin. I remember drinking a soda and I could feel the bubbles go down my throat. And it was exhilarating and yet there was a huge problem. Suddenly I was 27 years old and I'd essentially lived in a blackout for the past 10 years where I couldn't experience the world and, and learn things. So I had to figure out how to adult in the world, how to translate my skills into making money. And I knew that I had grit. I knew that I had will. I knew that I would show up and take action, but I didn't yet know that I, the action I could take would equate to progress and growth and learning and acquiring skills and tools. So um, what I would learn later on is that 
all of those, all of that work, all of those tools that I put in actually created such an incredible toolkit to help many clients of mine and, and many people in the world who experience these kind of trauma moments, the moment they sit down for um, a creative project. So um, I'll give you kind of some examples of this um, or, or just like a new reframe of this. And I'll tell you that when I was asked to, to speak here, I thought, ah, oh, I talk about procrastination all the time. I can do this. And I thought, ah, the thing I need to talk about is the thing that I don't talk about, right? The thing that makes me paralyzed when I go to write about this. The second I put pen to paper, I could hear Ted Hoagland and his words to me in that schoolroom. I could hear it and immediately my brain, the, the flashing lights went off and it said, under attack, under attack, under attack. Just like in your car, the check engine light goes off, right? And something's wrong. Now when that happens, for me, I do what a lot of people naturally do. I try and do anything I can to numb the pain of exposing myself to that level of discomfort and, and fear, right? So there are lots of kind of tools that we can use um, to numb ourselves from that pain. And those include eating, right? That's a quick fix to numb ourselves. Eating, you know, drinking another cup of coffee or going to the coffee, um, coffee lounge or picking up your phone picking up a distraction, you know, to, to look at scrolling, interrupting your process that way. Another one is um, manufacturing drama. Like how often when we're in the middle of trying to do a creative project, do we start obsessing with something else, right? So this is often just a tactic to interrupt ourselves from managing this the discomfort and the pain that we feel when we encounter kind of this, this place of, you can't do it. You're not going to be able to achieve this. Who do you think you are? Or that little voice, you know, in your head that recounts all of those moments where you were bullied or someone made fun of you or you were ostracized from, you know, a community or you were told that you weren't talented or that you weren't going to make it or any of those things. Those come, uh, those, those light up. Okay, so here's the thing. So when we talk about procrastination, when I work with people and when I work with myself on these, right, what I learned is you can numb these feelings of pain and it's absolutely fine, but the second you go back towards this, toward this task, you're going to expose yourself to, again, that same level of fear and you're going to be under attack again. So I'm going to show you some tools that you can use to kind of get under your own hood and turn off that check engine under attack button. Okay. So these are called, I'm going to show you three fear soothers. And I'm going to ask you, I know, I know some people, many people are probably sitting at their desk. I would invite you to stand up with me and practice this um, because it's, a, it's an experience with your body where you're going to kind of feel an opening. All right, so imagine yourself engaging in a creative process, whatever that could be. You know, maybe it's picking up your guitar and encountering the fear uh, and that kind of uncertainty of not knowing the words, you know, or th that, that you want to come up with in the next song. Or sitting down and like, you know, you need to send an invoice to a client and you are so fearful that they're going to say, you don't deserve this, I'm not paying you, or your rates are too high, or whatever that is. Or you sit down to write a poem and like me, you hear that professor's voice who says, you, you can't do this, you're, you're not talented, you cannot write, right? All right, so at that moment when every fiber of your being wants to jump out of your skin, I would invite you to sit with it and create safety rather than numb the pain. So I'm going to show you this tool. This is a grounding tool. Um, okay, so you can start and you can put one hand on your heart. And I want you to imagine as you breathe into your body that your legs are almost like these open tunnels that like they're almost like these pathways that are just empty tunnels like your bones are empty tunnels and I want you to go ahead and breathe in to your body and imagine the air filling that tunnel space so we're going to do it together so here you go breathe in you might want to close your eyes imagine the air um, filling in your body and breathe out and we'll try it again. Breathe in. Imagine the air coming in and filling in the vessel of your body. 
and breathe out. And I'm going to show you this another tool. I can track and see trauma in people when they speak because speaking is a scary thing for people. I want you to imagine there's a rod going from the back of your head almost down like a metal rod going out your tailbone. So when people have trauma and they speak, you know, and the fear, like you can see the fear, usually they do this thing with their head where they're almost like a talking head, you know, and they're, they're disconnected from their body. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to imagine breathing in through this rod that's coming out of your kind of like almost like your tailbone. So breathe in and see if you can breathe deeper into your body. So here we go. So breathe in and imagine breathing into that rod. So breathe in. You should feel your air, the breath almost like going out of your tailbone. Breathe out and we'll try it one more time. Breathe in. And breathe out. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you this other tool. This was incredibly beneficial. Um, for me and my healing process, although I wasn't aware of it. Um, and this is a tool that has helped many people actually heal from PTSD. So um, uh, this is a, a general um, tool based on EMDR, right? So we're going to actually engage both sides of the brain. And when we see people who have trauma, usually they get stuck in kind of the merry-go-round of remembering the emotional experience of remembering a moment. And so I'm going to show you how to take certain feelings that might be triggered simply by encountering the blank page. And we're going to go back and forth, left brain, right brain. And we're going to kind of trick your brain into remembering I'm 37. I'm not 20 years old. I'm not sitting in that classroom being humiliated or I'm not, you know, um, experiencing that rejection or that um, loss that I experienced. So here we go. We're going to engage left and right brain. Okay, so you want to take your hands and you'll do left, right, left, right. Now I want you to engage with me and I want you to take your eyes and follow left, right, left, right, and we'll do it 10 times and just follow your breathing. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, excellent. So you might feel that you're a little bit more in your body. And the final kind of more conceptual tool, and you can sit if you've been standing, is this tool about self-talk. So sometimes actually dissociation can work in our favor. So we might imagine that we are an incredibly loving, generous, kind parent. And if you didn't come from a family where you had that as an example, you can create your own parent. So you might talk to yourself, and this is what I do, in the third person, and you might say, Mary Jane, you're going to do great. You can do this. You're going to be fine. Just show up and be of service. Or it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just put some words on the page. You're going to be fine. Okay, so engaging in self-talk, it sounds like simple, but sometimes the inner voice is actually so severe that when we talk to ourselves in the third person and we speak out loud, our brains respond and hear the kind of soothing words of comfort. So I encourage you to talk to yourself. Now, the three practical tools I'm going to give you are, the first is here, a timer. I invite everyone to purchase a timer. Um, so the timer is incredibly valuable, and you can't use the timer on your phone because we know the phone is a perfect distraction gateway. But the timer is, um, the tool is to set your timer for 15 minutes, right? You can do anything for 15 minutes. And if you can't do it for 15 minutes, I understand. We'll set it for five. But here's the magic number. Once you hit the three minute threshold, your brain will go to a place that will say, I can do this. I'm safe. I'm not being attacked. I'm okay. It will go, it will, it will become soothed by the actual process. The second tool is to give yourself permission to, to do a D minus version. So sometimes I will get so stuck in procrastination of like making sure that I get it done perfectly or I write the proposal perfectly or I sit down and I, you know, play the piano perfectly. Right? Give yourself permission to do it completely and perfectly and actually aim to do the D minus version because you will then have exposed yourself to the pain and all you have to do then is go back and edit it and you won't be dealing with the, the feeling of fear because your brain will say, this isn't a scary task. 
And the third one is um, perhaps one of the most important, cultivate a tribe. So a tribe for me represents, and I have about 30 or 40 people in my tribe, um, people that I have collected um, over the years through um, you know, different organizations. And I'll tell you that these people are not often partners, spouses, family members, even best friends, although they can become friends. These are people that you go to that are kind of like your soul travelers, people you might meet at an event like this one, other people who are engaged in the creative process who you can reach out to and say, hey, I'm so stuck on this project. And they can say, all right, why don't we work together? I'll babysit the six-year-old in your brain that is freaking out, and you can babysit mine. And we'll work on this together, and we'll both be able to move through this process. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Think of yourself as an artist incubating magic, right? So sometimes the work we do isn't just sitting down at the piano or in front of the guitar or at the, pa at the page at our desk. Sometimes it's when we're taking a walk around the bayou or when we're watching that like silly Netflix movie that allows us to just relax and our brains feel safe enough to freely associate. So we incorporate that in our process and our focus is on creating safety. We actually invite the magic to come forth.